Good, Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. <laughs> uh, it's so great to see so many people here. My name is Rebecca Brindell, and I have the honor of serving as director of the Center for Bioethics here at Harvard Medical School. I join with my counterpart and brother, Dr. David Hodge, the director of the National Center for Bioethics in Research and Healthcare at Tuskegee University, who is joining us with his bioethics honors students at Tuskegee University via Zoom. And together, we welcome you to the fourth annual Black History Month Bioethics For Forum, co-sponsored by our institutions. We are also grateful to our internal HMS partners, the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine, chaired by Dr. Vikram Patel, and the Office of Diversity, Inclusion, and Community Partnerships under the direction of Dean Joan Reed, who I will formally introduce later as she has graciously agreed to moderate our discussion following the lecture. This lecture series began as the result of work the Bioethics Centers at Tuskegee and HMS started in the summer of 2020 under the leadership of our former directors, Drs. Reuben Warren and Bob Trug. Drs. Warren and Trug formed a weekly discussion group between members of our faculties to advance the conversation about race and the work of bioethics, a commitment that has persisted and grown to include scholarship, academic exchange, teaching and learning together alongside our students, and most importantly, deep respect, trust, and friendship. For this year's lecture, we are delighted to welcome our good friend, Professor Patrick Smith, Associate Research Professor of Theologic Ethics and Bioethics, Senior Fellow at the Keenan Institute for Ethics at Duke University, and director of the bioethics program for the Trent Center for Bioethics, Humanities, and History of Medicine at Duke University. He also holds an appointment as associate professor in population health sciences in the Department of Health Sciences at Duke Medical School. Patrick is a longtime member and friend of the Center for Bioethics. He completed his BS in business administration at Auburn University an MDiv at Trinity International University, and his MA and PhD in philosophy at Wayne State University. From 2013 to 2014, he completed the fellowship in bioethics at Harvard Medical School, and he taught in the Master of Bioethics program at HMS from 2015 to 2018 as a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. At Harvard, he has also served as a principal faculty member for the Initiative on Health, Religion, and Spirituality, which is an interfaculty initiative across the university that aims to be a research catalyst for an integrated model of spirituality, public health, and patient care in dialogue with spiritual communities. In Boston, he also served on the board of directors of organizations working for the common good and more equitable social arrangements, such as YW Boston, which aims to empower women and eliminate racism. He also contributed thought leadership by serving on the board of a community development corporation that supports local communities through building affordable housing, engaging in advocacy work, and providing education on housing policies and practices. Professor Smith has been honored as a 2016 to 2017 Henry Luce III Fellow in Theology, received the 2019 Paul Ramsey Award for Excellence in Bioethics, and in 2022 received the Edmund Pellegrino Medalist Award in Healthcare Ethics. He has served as a member of the Board of Directors and the Executive Committee for the American Society of Bioethics and Humanities, of which he is now president-elect. His current research and writing are in the areas of moral philosophy, bioethics, theological ethics, end-of-life care, and religious social ethics. Please join me in welcoming our friend and colleague, Patrick Smith, to deliver this year's Black History Month bioethics lecture entitled, Reflections from an Imperfect Art. 
Jazz, Health Justice, and the Moral Practice of Medicine. Welcome, Patrick. Well, thank you so much uh, for that introduction. Uh, really appreciate being back here, and thanks for the uh, invitation uh, to be here. And thanks to all of you for coming out uh, this evening, uh, Thursday evening, to uh, talk uh, with us. We hope and to hear uh, some thoughts and some reflections that uh, I have here. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here for this Black History Month event. And I always jump at the opportunity to come back uh, to this particular space. Uh, I was joking with someone else. They said something like, hey, can you uh, come to Boston to do whatever? And I said, well, yeah, sure. And they're like, well, I haven't even told you what it is. I said, well, it really doesn't matter. We can just work out the details uh, afterwards and just make sure there's no conflict with the, uh, with the other dates. So this is, uh, I look at it as a kind of second home for me uh, in many ways. And I don't miss the weather. Uh, but I do miss uh, a lot of the people and obviously the work here. And it's just uh, an awesome, uh, just privilege to be able to be with bright students, gifted trainees, skilled professionals, good colleagues, and even better friends. Uh, now, <clears throat> I do want to acknowledge uh, the partners of this uh, lecture series here. So Dr. David Hodge, Director of the National Center for Bioethics and Research and Healthcare. Uh, of course, my uh, good friend uh, Bob True, the former director of the center, uh, whose watch I came in under. Uh, so I appreciate him taking a chance on me, bringing me in. Uh, of course, Dr. Ed Hundert, associate director of the Center for Bioethics and former dean of medical education, who's just been a light and a beacon in terms of his uh, thinking and organizational leadership uh, in terms of education. And of course, my good friend, uh, Dr. Rebecca Brindell, uh, we figured out how to, uh, as we say, kind of dance together when we were co-teaching and, uh, it was an a interesting experience and one that um, we lived through. Uh, we think that things uh, came out all right in the, on the back end here. And I'm particularly uh, just grateful for Dr. Joan Reed, uh, the dean of Harvard Medical School, being here with us in this particular space as well, taking time out of a, what's no doubt a very busy schedule to, uh, I would say, hang out with us for a little while. <clears throat> now, I must begin by giving some qualifications. I do have a background in philosophy, and sometimes philosophers die the death of a thousand qualifications, right? You know, and so I'll do a little bit of that. Uh, so I do want to begin by saying that I am not a musician, uh, although I played at a saxophone during my teenage years, uh, nor am I a jazz historian or a teacher of music theory. I'm just someone trained in philosophy and theological ethics, working in the area of bioethics who loves music, in particular jazz, and one who has found in this particular genre resources that I think can shape the ethical life. And so actually in some of my teaching over the years, some of the motifs I'll just try to highlight and introduce, uh, and maybe not unpack fully, are things that actually inform my pedagogy. Uh, it informs the way that I uh, not only teach, but also uh, engage in conversation, the way I thought about doing the work of clinical ethics years ago when I was more involved in doing clinical ethics consultation. Now, I am not foolish enough to believe that everyone is here because they like jazz music, okay? Uh, some of you may be here because you may be thinking about what kind of Jedi mind trick uh, I may be trying to pull off bringing these topics together this evening. And I don't think one has to like jazz music to really appreciate what some of the motifs we find in jazz understood as more than a music, what it can contribute to our thinking about the moral practice of medicine and to movements towards health justice. <clears throat> now, those of us who may have some awareness of jazz performance may see the vibrant um, and seemingly joyful appearance of artists and the relaxed settings we often inhabit during these performances as conveying a deep um, sense of joy and freedom, and perhaps rightly so. Maybe there are images that are conjured up of kind of laid back, relaxed, chilled out, and cool cats jamming on instruments and creating experiences of catharsis for all those participating when they find the groove. Some of us may have an added stereotype of some musician who is able to have an entire conversation with you while holding a cigarette between his lips without ever taking it out, right? I don't know. And if you've never seen that before, it is a sight, right? Have you ever seen that, right? People can carry on a whole conversation, it's like amazing, right? The outward appearance of joy 
and deep ecstatic experiences that some may have when engaging this music could possibly obscure some important features about jazz, understood, again, as more than a music. To appreciate this, I think it's important to remember jazz as a distinctly or distinctively African-American generated musical art form with worldwide impact coming together around the turn of the 20th century. I want to suggest that awareness of the socio-political and historical context of where jazz came from is important to note uh, in order to understand how jazz may inform the ethical life. I think too often we run past that particular context, that nexus of issues that kind of brought um, this kind of rise of bringing some things together, things that didn't seem to go together, uh, instruments that were never intended to be played together in spaces that didn't expect those performances. There's something about that that I think is very interesting that I hope that we can tease out a little bit uh, this evening. Now, its birthplace is said to be in New Orleans. Uh, early accounts describe, uh, and again, this origin story is very complex, like any origin story, as we know there are so many different lines of convergence here. Uh, these early accounts describe how the Spanish, who let their Catholicized slaves have Sundays off, would gather in Congo Square. And Congo Square uh, is the southern part of Armstrong Park in New Orleans and played a central role in the development of jazz. And here, these enslaved people of the 19th century would play African music characterized by accented offbeat rhythms that would become a fundamental ingredient to the development of jazz music. Now the music contained elements of slave songs, the spirituals, uh, bent blue notes, and African drum rhythms along with many other features It made up this eclectic mix. Award-winning music historian Ted Joya brings this together and these observations together when he writes these words. He says, no urban area on the planet offered a more diverse cultural mix during the years leading up to the emergence of jazz than New Orleans. New Orleans was the melting pot within the larger melting pot of American life. And when such close interaction and exposed to so many disparate influences, exciting new hybrids invariably emerge from the mix. In this instance, the result was jazz a distinctive performance style created by black Americans who drew on and added to the extraordinary musical ecosystem of the turn of the century, New Orleans. When we listen to the ways new millennium jazz mixes effortlessly with Latin and Caribbean currents or with the formal structures of Western classical music, we are experiencing a continuation of the cultural dialogue that presided over the idiom's birth. So says Ted Joya. And this is fascinating and interesting because, this, again, the geographical space and the social, cultural, historical context matters with regard to this particular genre of music and if we think we can draw something from it uh, for the ethical life. Now, around the time that when jazz emerged uh, on the scene, New Orleans was one of the unhealthiest cities in the United States. Uh, the yellow fever epidemic raged through the city in 1878. Black infant mortality in the city at the time was 45%, and the typical lifespan of an African American was only 36 years. All cities had to deal with public health risk, of course, but New Orleans was especially dangerous, according to some uh, medical uh, jazz historians. Because of this particular mix of well-traveled residents, climate, population density, and poor local sanitation. So one cannot forget also the deep racial discrimination social injustice, and economic exploitation that was being experienced by African-American people at this time. Of course, uh, there were many from other racial and ethnic backgrounds experiencing various forms of discrimination and exploitation. And it is important to note for the purpose of this talk, on this occasion, the social marginalization of black people uh, at this time in this particular context of the turn of the century uh, New Orleans here. And so jazz vocalist Ruth Naomi Floyd can say without hyperbole, I would suggest, that jazz is the art form uh, born out of oppression and pain. And so this, I would suggest, again, is important to keep in mind when thinking about jazz as more than a music and reflecting on it for the ethical life. <clears throat> now, like many of you, no doubt, I think there is something powerful about the musical arts. Uh, I think there is something interesting about jazz being an imperfect 
art. Uh, following those working in aesthetic philosophy, we can think about jazz being an imperfect art in contrast with other forms of art. As will be stated in just a few minutes, the very nature of jazz demands a kind of spontaneity within parameters. Often improvised art is considered to be a kind of second-rate art by some philosophers of art or those who do uh, aesthetics in some ways uh, as a kind of art which is necessarily less worthy of our attention than that which is the result of careful planning all the way through from beginning to end, right? <clears throat> and so many of the virtues that those working in aesthetics sometimes search for in other forms of art, things such as premeditated design, balance, between form and content and overall symmetry are sometimes absent in jazz. Or maybe at least not represented in the same degree in the same ways. And so the question that I just think about here and just throw out is can the imperfect art of jazz stand alongside other forms of art, such as poetry, painting, and the literary arts, etc., in the realm of aesthetic beauty? I think so. Uh, with respect to this. And it is interesting because many folks working in the arts now have pushed back against some of the criteria that are set up and established that determines what really counts as genuine art or beauty. And I think there's something very important about this, especially looking at something like jazz, such that I've been on record in other spaces to suggest that if you're operating under some framework, guidelines, or criteria, um, of judging what art is and isn't, and if that criteria can actually exclude jazz as an art form, I want to say not so much that is bad for jazz, I will say it's so much for the criteria that you're using to judge, to make those kinds of judgments, right? And we always toggle and wrestle with these kinds of issues, right, in terms of what our criteria are able to do to judge something and how the phenomena itself can help reframe the criteria that we use to make the kinds of judgments that we make. And in many ways, I think this is what uh, looking at certain motifs that come from jazz can really, really help us to do. Give us some things to kind of go back and look that we haven't seen before, perhaps heard before, and perhaps our bodies, our communities, our work might be able to move to a slightly different rhythm. Now, follow the judgment here, again, of uh, Tej Joya. And this is what he says with regard to this particular issue here. He says, clearly any set of aesthetic standards which seek perfection or near perfection in the work of art will find little to praise in jazz. Yet this approach, however prevalent, is not the only valid way of evaluating works of art. A contrasting, if not complementary, attitude looks not at the art in isolation, but in relation to the artist who created it. It asks whether that work is expressive of the artist whether it reflects their own unique and incommensurable perspective on their art, whether it makes a statement without which the world would be, in some small way, a lesser place. This, I believe, is precisely the attitude towards art that delights in jazz, uh, Ted jo Joya says. Now, maybe we can still draw some reflections from this imperfect art that is no doubt generated from imperfect people for the imperfect practice of medicine in an imperfect world. And for me, there's something that's reassuring about that. Even if people want to frame this particular art form as an imperfect art, right? there's something about it that seems to be fitting, as all of our art is often generated by imperfect people for an imperfect world. So. What beats can we hit to create rhythms in the moral practice of medicine that is marked by attention to equity in health care and towards health justice? And, and you know, Bob Trug, I, I never thought I would be here at Harvard Medical School actually saying, like, what beats can we hit to create rhythms, right? And so the talk <laughs> gives me an opportunity to actually say that phrase, right? You know? It's like, hey, I said it right there. And they recorded it, right? So you take it. Though there are many ways that this can be done, let me briefly highlight three kind of major themes for us to reflect upon. Then hopefully we'll have time and conversation to kind of riff off of these themes with one another to see what it is that we can create. 
And so for me, whenever I talk about this subject in different spaces, I like to get to the dialogue and the conversation uh, because I think that's where uh, often some of these ideas become much more generative when people share different experiences and build and go in very different directions and reimagine things and create something very new here. So the first theme I want to highlight and raise for us in thinking about this issue is syncopation. Syncopation, okay? So this idea of syncopation um, is certainly part of various forms of music, right? So it's not um, uh, solely restricted to uh, jazz, right? Uh, but as some have often said, that uh, jazz is syncopation gone mad, right? Uh, so uh, this idea of syncopation is kind of being aware of the main beats and the off beats, okay? Uh, you accent that which is always there, but it hasn't been heard, right? So this emphasis on the offbeat, the emphasis on the upbeat, finding the beat on the offbeat, accenting rhythms that run within or even counter to the dominant momentum of, let's say, an institution that can uncover or reveal a rhythm that was otherwise hidden. The idea here is closely related to the idea, some would say, of swing, right? This notion of swing, uh, that is, it impacts, or it picks up momentum, presses forward and searches for what is to come. Swing is that basic unit of rhythm when everybody, everything is in sync, right, in a particular way. So syncopation is this emphasizing of the offbeat, or emphasis on the upbeat, that establishes a rhythm, a pattern that identifies those things that maybe were previously hidden. I think this becomes really important in thinking about um, the ethical life, being aware of the main beats and the off beats. You accent that which was always there again, and learning the art of syncopation makes us much more aware of the moment that we're in. Syncopation helps us to notice that which is unnoticed. I think we can see in terms of the ethical life, the way I think about this in many ways is that I come from a particular kind of ethical, philosophical, intellectual, spiritual tradition that talks about emphasizing um, uh, focus on those at the margins, right? Having priority options for those who are excluded, uh, the poor and other marginalized voices. And so this idea of syncopation just always reminds me anyway, I'll just speak autobiographically here, uh, that in the normal rhythm of my work, the pattern of my work, to always be paying attention to that which may be hidden. And so that's not something I have to do each time or try to check a box or remind myself, what am I supposed to be doing here? But again, this idea of syncopation, that momentum that moves everything forward, that creates a rhythm of life becomes part of the way one does one's work, right? So this idea of syncopation, I think, becomes extremely important. And so when we wrestle with um, issues in the clinic, those of you who are preparing to be medical doctors, uh, many of you may be ethicists in here, are doing work in clinical ethics, I think this idea of syncopation has something to teach us, something that if we can embrace in different ways, uh, it helps us to begin to understand what it means to listen well, to find those rhythms that we normally would not see here. The second um, uh, theme or motif that I think is important and interesting that in, can inform uh, the ethical life is this notion of improvisation. Right? Some would say improv, or another way that some people who talk about these kinds of issues put this as this notion of infinite play. Okay, uh, Infinite possibility of creative solution and generosity of work. Uh, what that has to say about hope and moving forward toward what we cannot yet see, okay? Now again, just like syncopation, other forms of music may employ improvisation, certainly, but in jazz, it is something that ex is expected, right? If there is no improvisation, there is no jazz. To compose in the moment can be a risky enterprise, of course, and yet it is necessary to the very enterprise itself. Now, for those of you who may be interested, there may be some people uh, who do work in philosophy of music, right, or philosophy of jazz in particular, and I promised myself that we would not kind of go into this, right? But there are some interesting philosophical questions about the nature of improvisation, right? That if there is no 
jazz without improvisation, right? What does that mean? Can we listen to jazz after it's been recorded, right, on a CD? Uh, or if we listen to it more than once, then do we, are we really listening to jazz anymore, right? These kind of interesting kind of metaphysical questions that come into uh, play here. Or what is the nature of improvisation? Is it really a kind of creatio ex nihilo, right? Or uh, something that's out of nothing? Or does it come from a place that's been seasoned, that's been shaped by practice and listening carefully and other kinds of things, right? All these interesting questions that really, I think, don't change the dynamic of the point that's being made here. That improvisation is an essential ingredient in this uh, thing called jazz that is more than a music. I think for me, uh, it becomes really important because improvisation is that which allows jazz to exist in a continual state of renewal, right? There's a kind of freshness to the music. Improvisation is often seen as an essential, if not the essential characteristic of jazz. It is improvisation that makes the playing of the same old song so to speak, seem like a new song every time it is performed because it is a music of traditions and freedom. Now, the idea that jazz is a music of traditions and freedom, I argue, is very, very important to keep in mind. <clears throat> Improvisation is the willingness to live within the bounds of the past and yet to search for the future at the same time. Improvisation is the desire to make something new out of something old. It is the craving to respect tradition while at the same time leaving one's own mark. Improvisation is having a plan and yet not being incarcerated by the plan. It is experienced in being open to letting the people around you, whether they are in the band or spectators in the audience, have input into an impact on what it is that you're creating, says one uh, jazz enthusiasts with regard to this issue of improvisation here. And I think this is really, really key, this notion of traditions and freedom, right? And so when I think about the notion of improvisation, it's not just kind of making things up as you go along, just out of nowhere, right? There's a framework, there are theories, there are traditions, there are resources that have already gone in to inform the work. And within those parameters, there's a kind of flexibility and creativity to reimagine the moment. So I think, uh, at least when I think about clinical ethics consultations or whatever we're doing, uh, the ability to be able to improvise, to think about new ways forward when we face dilemmas, where we confront these areas where we think there's no other way forward, or we face issues that we think, hey, there's no way that we can go around this or get around this, what is this idea of improvisation? How does it continue to be something that's on the forefront of our minds such that we can look for alternative possibilities? Again, syncopation helps us begin to look at those areas that we previously were not looking. And so as this syncopation, this new rhythm is coming along, and as we're getting to a point where we need to improvise, there are still the parameters that are needed. The, yes, the theory, right? Uh, the good philosophy or good conceptual resources, uh, uh, Questions of moral psychology, dealing with uh, the emotions and all those things become very, very important. And yet, there are still ways that we have to operationalize those issues and do it in the moment. And this notion of improvisation, I think, can really help us continue to reimagine possibilities. Improvisation is about being so familiar for musicians with their instrument of choice uh, the song and the essentials that they can trust themselves to search for the unseen, for what the moment is presenting. And so I think here uh, we can learn and grow uh, each time, right? Um, somebody engages in improvisation because they never play the same song twice. And so if we think about it in terms of the clinical context we may find ourselves in, that every patient encounter is different, even if it is familiar. Think about that just for a moment. Every patient encounter is different, even if it is familiar. Right? I mean, of course, uh, those of you who are trained as clinicians, I, I'm not trained uh, in that way, as you know in the bio. Uh, I'm uh, married to a medical professional, so I have to try to live vicariously uh, through her uh, in some ways, and, and I don't do that very well, uh, often thinking about that. And so uh, hopefully I'm not speaking out of school here. Uh, but yes, I mean, there are ways that you're trained to see very similar situations, similar diagnoses, maybe similar pathways forward, yes. And a lot of that can carry over and inform any particular encounter. But this notion of improvisation, I think, right, 
playing the same song a new way is a reminder that every particular clinical encounter, even if it's familiar, is still nevertheless different. And what improvisation and those who engage improvisations have to do in order to do that well in the moment, to be creative in the moment, and to do that with a kind of excellence, they have to listen carefully. Right? Not only in syncopation do you have to listen, but certainly with regard to this notion of improvisation. It requires a deep kind of listening, a deep awareness of the moment and the situation. And again, thinking about these issues going forward as we can unpack that, uh, this becomes extremely important for us. Keeping the creativity in the moment with the particular patient by listening to the unique perspective and experiences of those persons for that particular time. Now, <clears throat> there's this last uh, theme. Again, there could be so many more aspects that uh, we could have highlighted here. Uh, questions of uh, notions of time and tone, right, that have all these implications. And again, for the sake of time and just getting the conversation, uh, here's the last of the three that I want to just highlight or hold up for us to think a little bit about here for the ethical life. This notion of economy of play, or call and response, as some people would say. Now, this comes out of a, uh, a certain kind of tradition, right? You know, African Americans talk about these, their spiritual traditions as being call and response, right? Calling, speaking out, and then a response from uh, those who are listening and engaging. Uh, Dr. Brindell, when she uh, in, uh, introduced us today and it brought us to a welcome, she was like, you can do better than that, right? She was calling out to you, hoping that you would respond, right, in kind. So this notion of call and response uh, points to this deep sense of kind of give and take, mutuality that is playful and not begrudging. It's neither procedural nor merely, okay, now it's your turn to play, I guess, so you kind of jump in, right? This notion is very relational and communal. It represents a deeply community-focused uh, way of life. Everyone is to be involved, right? There's not merely a performer on a stage or spectators in the audience or sound engineers who are controlling technical components, right? Musicians are often calling out to each other and the others respond. The group calls out to the audience, right? And they are conditioned to respond. The audience then calls out to the musicians and they respond. It is a moment of mutuality and deep relationality. Now, I've talked to some musicians, they often say when they're on stage, <laughs> Uh, but there are times where uh, some do more calling and not allowing as many people to respond, right? And they have their ways of checks and balances of, of trying to make space and create space uh, for other voices to be heard. But this is really the substance of this notion of call and response to highlight the opportunity for the contribution of others and to also emphasize voices, giving space for folks to be able to speak and engage. And so we think about these clinical dynamics oftentimes where we're going back and forth, where a lot of information is going one way from medical professionals who are very knowledgeable and bring something to the table. But again, as just as syncopation and improvisation require deep listening, so does this notion of call and response it requires a deep kind of listening to hear exactly what is being called for. What is the proper response? Are we holding space for other voices to emerge? You know, I think about some of these conversations around when we think about the challenge of, um, you know, speech and um, challenges in our contemporary setting in many ways. And uh, I do think there's something about this notion of call and response to me that reflects this idea of kind of uh, calling people in instead of calling people out kind of opens up an invitational space for others to play. And oftentimes there is this distance, there is this tension uh, in the music. And oftentimes when you have various instruments coming in or various voices that are being played, there is a kind of strategic dissonance that can serve a genuine purpose. And so I think this notion of call and response in conversation with improvisation syncopation helps us to begin to think about these dynamics as part of the normal rhythm of the way that we engage in the world and think about the questions of medicine here. So there is this economy of generosity, as some uh, music theorists would say. 
So how the art seems to uh, produce a radical giving within the community is something I think to be uh, embraced here. And again, all this leads to the uh, opportunity for uh, those who are participating, right? Not just the performers, so to speak, but even those who are listening in to be part of finding the group, right? Or being part of the swing. And so again, each of these three themes, syncopation, improvisation, and notions of call and response requires a kind of deep listening here. Now, as we kind of transition just a little bit to just kind of think about uh, in broad ways, especially given the uh, event, this Black History Month event, uh, kind of turning, uh, looking at uh, broadly this question of uh, kind of racism uh, in medicine, the historical legacy of some of that. Uh, I think it's important to kind of think a little bit about how some of this may uh, or how this could inform some of these larger ideas that have to always be operationalized in the particular, in the concrete uh, moments of our very spaces. But following thinkers like Alistair McIntyre, understanding moral practice as an activity in which people work together using specific skills and methods toward a shared goal, okay? Further, the goals including the habits and dispositional traits necessary for achieving those goals themselves are considered good for the professional practice and for society at large. All right, now I was in this space for a little while and, and before uh, all the ethicists in the room object to be, or become too indignant with reference to a broad notion uh, of the good, uh, I will in exasperation with you say and acknowledge that yes, it is easier said than determined, right? I, I get it, I'm with you on that, right? Uh, nevertheless, I take it that medicine is a moral practice with goals, maybe not always well-defined, with some internal values to itself. And the values of medicine interact and intersect with broader sets of social values that can support or be in tension uh, with it in various encounters. And so as an example as to how these motifs may help to create a different rhythm, let's just look at a broad issue here. Uh, the persistence of health and healthcare disparities along racialized lines. I would argue, remains a perennial problem for the moral practice of medicine. In a space like this, I will not dare uh, insult your intelligence nor test your patience by rehearsing these data. And so I will be summative here by noting that there is an extensive body of research detailing the significant health and healthcare gaps between racial and ethnic minorities and their white counterparts. Racial and ethnic minorities have poor health outcomes, experience a lower quality of service, when engaging healthcare, receive basic medical procedures at a lesser rate, shorter life expectancies, and have more significant challenges accessing healthcare, generally speaking, yes, broadly, than white Americans. These sorts of disparities were analyzed over 20 years ago, culminating in a report from the National Academy of Medicine titled Unequal Treatment, Confronting Racial and Ethnic Disparities in Healthcare, uh, that was published in 2003. Now, the report noted that the sources of these disparities range across various levels of the health sector, including the patient level, provider level, process level, and system level. And the main thing to keep in mind here from this report from over 20 years ago is how extensive and intensive these matters are for the health sector and for U.S. society. Now, a legitimate question can be raised here, right? I mean, look, that was 20 years ago, dude, right? Data changes, right? Um, where do things stand two decades after the report on equal treatment? Well, according to David Williams uh, here at the Chan School of Public Health, he says not as much has changed regarding the findings of the report as many had hoped. He says, to be sure, there has been some progress in researchers noting a greater sense of awareness as to how racial disparities in health outcomes and health care is a problem for the health sector. Yet after accounting for health care access differentials, the severity of diseases and socioeconomic status, the racial disparities found 20 years earlier uh, by and large persist, according to David Williams. Researchers and ethicists have also shown the connection between these disparities along racialized lines and the history and sordid legacy of what some would call anti-black racism. Uh, of course, um, I won't spend as much time on this, maybe we can come up a little bit later, uh, we think about uh, these issues here about the black-white divide with something in particular like infant and maternal mortality, which has been debated by researchers and doctors for more than two decades, uh, two decades as well. 
And so there's this notion that for black women in America, there is this, uh, some would say, inescapable atmosphere of societal and systemic racism that creates a kind of toxic physiological stress that results in conditions uh, that lead directly to higher rates of infant mortality and maternal death. And so there's this notion that these health disparities are linked to these notions of racism. That racism is, is not just about the racial disparities that one sees, but can be, uh, one can point to questions of racism as an explanatory or partial explanatory factor for some of this data and the experiences of certain individuals. Now, what's fascinating about this is that uh, many uh, black women um, have been uh, have reported that they have been disregarded when they give their testimony about what they're experiencing in their bodies in many ways. Uh, those concerns have gone um, uh, unheeded uh, in many ways, uh, despite these individuals having a pretty good sense of what may be happening in their very own bodies. And one can immediately think of the Serena Williams case from many years ago when she was having her first child. Right? You remember in 2017, she was... Um, uh, her birth experience became life-threatening after her nursing team and physician did not respond to her initial concerns about her history of pulmonary, uh, pulmonary embolisms. And she had to insist that they give her the proper tests and treatments before they realized that she was correct about her shortness of breath and what could have been a minor intervention uh, at an earlier stage turned into over a month of having to be bedridden as a new mother. Okay. And so in some ways, hers was not a case of class bias or lack of health literacy in terms of the reasons why her concerns were not initially considered accurate and valid. And so again, these notions that we're talking about, questions of syncopation, right? Looking at um, you know, the margins or how do we think about the testimony uh, of others? Uh, questions of uh, obviously call and response, listening to what other people are saying and responding in ways that may be more appropriate. Um, again, I mean, the same thing could be said with regard to uh, questions that surround racial bias and pain assessment, right, and treatment recommendations, how African Americans many times uh, are uh, undertreated with regard to pain and their report of pain. And a lot of this comes out of a, a kind of a history of medical racism saying that, you know, black people had a different type of uh, physiology such that uh, they don't experience pain in the same way as other human beings uh, would, right? Uh, we see tragic cases of these kind of things still happening today. Uh, I remember watching that video, heartbreaking video of Dr. Susan Moore, a uh, medical doctor uh, during COVID who uh, ended up uh, dying uh, later in the, the hospital. She continued to tell uh, her care team what she was experiencing. Many of uh, much of the, her testimony was disregarded uh, in that particular space. And it was just a heartbreaking um, video to watch and to reflect and just think about maybe what she was experiencing. And the experiences of somebody like Dr. Susan Moore and Serena Williams are multiplied, right? In many ways, the experience of black women and other people uh, from other groups uh, as well. <clears throat> now, look. Uh, addressing racism in medicine and health disparities along racialized lines is a tall order. I, I get it. Right? Uh, and even more so when placed in the context of larger social and systemic dynamics that directly and negatively impact health and human well-being. So what is the responsibility of medical schools, perhaps in their hospital systems, in the formation of professionals to address the negative effects of racism on their patients' health outcomes and their ability to deliver quality health care to communities of color? Some clinical healthcare professionals may think this question is a bit misguided, right? Even if they lament these conditions, they think the responsibility of addressing them perhaps lies outside of their purview and expertise. After all, how can they, with the specialized training they've received, address such large-scale upstream drivers that stifle health and human well-being? This simply asks too much of medical professionals. Or maybe this asks too much of medical professionals alone. I actually think that healthcare professionals, schools, and systems can make a contribution to addressing this colossal problem. Um, the Duke University School of Medicine, where I serve, has entered into this space, right? Uh, again, as any institution that's wrestling with these issues, uh, oftentimes, yes, perhaps we, we all do it clumsily in different ways. Um, I reference our program not so much that it can be held up as the model for such work, 
uh, or that is getting everything right. Rather, I just highlight it because it is the context where I currently work and I'm trying to make a contribution. And so the leadership has sought to implement systemic changes to dismantle racism and advance equity, diversity, and inclusion in the School of Medicine, identifying five major areas of priority. First, to cultivate an anti-racist environment, to nurture, reward, and attract outstanding talent, to advance education and training to support an anti-racist workforce, to develop an anti-racist equity-centered and community-engaged research practices, and lastly, to ensure sustainability by strengthening leadership capacity and organizational accountability. So there is a, a document uh, that outlines those five uh, points with different checks and balances and guidelines and action steps that um, hopefully will hold the institution uh, accountable and those committees that are dedicated to ensuring that these um, objectives are being operationalized uh, and making sure that this becomes a priority. And in many ways, thinking about this notion of syncopation, right, call and response, improvisation, uh, or ways of helping, I think, people navigate a space that perhaps is unfamiliar while still looking for the freedom to reimagine, but also within the parameters of what needs to be maintained. Now, maybe these reflections from an imperfect art, all that jazz, we may say, can be of help with guiding these processes and navigating these spaces. Considering the systemic nature of the problem, ways forward require both individual and communal responses and organizational responses. To be sure, this commitment requires leadership to incorporate these elements into its organizational structure and other processes related to its strategic initiatives, and it requires a level of reciprocity on the part of all working in these spaces to create and maintain a culture of health at an institutional level. I hope this can be done. I think it can. And maybe this is the kind of moral practice of medicine uh, that might just move us to a kind of healing uh, that we all may need. So thanks so much for giving me a hearing here. I look forward to a conversation with you. Thank you so much for that incredibly inspiring lecture. When I think about the kind of conversation uh, that, or I think about the private conversation that Bob and Ruben must have had in bringing us together a number of years ago to think about what bioethics could do to uh, advance equity and, uh, and to reach the good. Um, I, I can't imagine a better way to capture the key features of how we could do that work than the story you've told us through jazz about noticing the unseen and centering the margins, respecting the past to invent the future, and embedding ourselves in relationality and, commu and community to lift all voices. Thank you for those incredible remarks, and we have so much now to think about and talk about. I can't think of anyone better to guide us through this discussion than Joan Reed. Joan Reed is the Dean for Diversity and Community Partnership at Harvard Medical School. She is Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Professor of Society, Human Development, and Health at the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health. She graduated from Brown University and Mount Sinai School of Medicine and holds an MPH and MS in Health Policy Management from the Chan School, as well as an MBA from Boston University. She's, Joan has a lifelong passion for mentoring and supporting diversity in the biosciences. She's responsible for the development and management of a comprehensive program that provides leadership, guidance, and support to promote the increased recruitment retention and advancement of underrepresented minority faculty. While at HMS, Joan has created more than 20 diversity and leadership focused programs, including founding the HMS Minority Faculty Development Program and the Biomedical Sciences Career Program. Before joining Harvard, she served as the medical director of a Boston community health center and worked as a pediatrician in community and academic health centers, juvenile prisons, and public schools. 
She has held many advisory roles, serving on the HHS Advisory Committee on Minority Health and the Secretary's Advisory Committee to the Director of NIH. She is a member of the National Academy of Medicine and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please join me in welcoming our colleague and friend, Dr. Joan Reed, to begin our conversation today. Um, so I want to start by saying thank you so much for providing me an opportunity to participate in this, to our office to be one of the co-sponsors, um, and to, to join in this collaborative effort between um, the Center for Bioethics and Research and what has built by, with Ruben Warren, now run by David Hodge at Tuskegee, and what um, Bob Trug helped build here now is run by Becca Brindell um, at Harvard Medical School. And for me, wonderful examples of part of what you talked about today, about the coming together of different perspectives and different worlds to create something new and different. Um, and so, uh, again, thank you for being, let, allowing me to be a, uh, a part of this. Um, I'll tell you, I wrote um, something here that you said that, that really struck me. And it was talking about jazz as an imperfect art generated from imperfect people in an imperfect world. And I started to think about those of us who practice medicine. Um, that art of that medicine we practice, those of us who actually do it, the providers, the musicians, as you might put it, working in systems that are very much imperfect. Absolutely. And this connection across here, and through all of this, trying to get to something that's better. Um, and that other piece that you talked about, about what does better mean and what does perfect mean in that space. And as I think about this and what you have presented here, which to me was very much intriguing, did you wake up one morning and this just came to you? <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Um, <laughs> uh, well, if, if it did, I probably should not disclose the kind of night I had before. Right? <laughs> Even though the ethics of psychedelic treatment is now a thing, right? so we have that conversation perhaps. But uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I think for me, it, it comes from uh, uh, we, we could I could go back to thinking about my my childhood here, right? Uh, yeah, I come from a family background of uh, folks who valued um, you know education, uh, faith, uh, and music uh, in particular. And so many of our family members were involved in the musical arts, uh, some were involved in the literary arts, uh, some were uh, involved in the civil rights movement in, in Birmingham, you know, Alabama, uh, in significant ways, uh, in, you know, different parts of the Southeast. And so it's just one of these ideas that the kind of cultural, like African American cultural aesthetic, uh, jazz was kind of part of that mix of those resources. And so I kind of just thought about it was in the background in some ways. And then I had a friend of mine, we were in high school. He ended up coming to Berkeley School of Music uh, here in Boston uh, for a couple of years. And then, you know, we were talking. He, I was over his house, and he says, oh, he says, Pat, you got to hear this, right? So he throws in this, this CD. It was uh, John Coltrane Giant Steps, right? And I, at that time, I, as I mentioned earlier, I was playing at a saxophone, right? So I was in you know, band, so I kind of appreciated, like, okay, music. And I started listening. I was like... Goodness, what is this guy doing, right? Uh, and I knew it was something pretty impressive and amazing. So at that point, I really got captivated in some ways by the music as a, as a teenager. Uh, and one who could not play, you know, jazz. I couldn't improv, right, or anything. But I was just so captivated, drawn in by it. And so it's something that kind of stayed with me. And I kind of did a little bit of reading and thinking about it. And as I continued to get a little bit older, I would hear people make reference to, to jazz. And oftentimes they would refer to, like, ethics and think about things and ways of life. And all of that was starting to kind of be conditioned. Then I would come across uh, what I was doing, work in philosophy, right, philosophy of music. And then looking at people uh, writing about philosophy of jazz, like, oh, 
this is really cool. I can bring both worlds together, you know, uh, in some ways. And, and then uh, just beginning to think about this more and more. And then I think just through a series of uh, conversations uh, with artists who are doing this work kind of day in and, and day out. Um, as I've been reading, uh, thinking about my own kind of, I, I use the term vocation because I look at it as you know, not really a job, but something I'm kind of drawn to uh, that uh, a lot of the experiences of my life kind of have shaped me for that. And so for me, this is kind of the how it came to be. It just kind of shapes the rhythm, hopefully, of my life and the outlook and how I approach the work that I do. Thank you for that. And, and struck as you're talking about that, of the many ways in which um, different elements of our exposures and experiences shape us to where we are today. Absolutely. And we sometimes forget how we got here. Yeah. We sort of think that this this linear path and it's this journey and, and, and coming together um, in different ways. I was also struck in this by the concept of perfect art. Yeah. And would really like to talk to you uh, you to talk more uh, about this. And I will tell you my bias. Yeah. I have seen perfection nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> and so, really, what does that mean, yeah. perfect art? And what does that mean in an academic medical center, in medicine, and this space? Yeah, and I, I thank you for, for saying that. And it's interesting because, you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, it was like this kind of perfect art. But, but it's interesting, though, the way conversations often, and again, I'm not a, uh, my specialty is not philosophy of art necessarily, or aesthetics, even though I'm very much interested in that. But when you think about certain uh, kind of um, uh, enlightenment approaches to aesthetics and art uh, and, and beauty and defining the art world, right? There's this notion of like kind of symmetry and precision and all these kinds of things that uh, looking at the, the artifact as a thing unto itself, kind of detached from the artist in some way so that we can get the kind of objectivity that we need to give the necessary and sufficient conditions to identify the properties of what makes something beautiful. And so when we see it instantiated in all these different arts, are these artifacts, then we can make these judgments, right? And it's something about, I think, the expression, the art form of jazz that troubles those waters in some ways. I think rightfully so. And so I think you're right. I mean, there's, and you know, some people say, well, look, we're not saying there's perfect art, but there are these criteria, these standards. And I think when people like uh, Ted Joya and many others talk about jazz being imperfect art, it's really kind of, they're getting at something here. They're saying, look, the criteria that normally are used to make these kinds of judgments may actually not work with respect to this. And that's okay because this art form is phenomenological expression uh, and the phenomenological experience of those who are participating in it pushes back against that. And it's a reminder, I think. So when I think about my work and life and how we navigate the world, as I mentioned, I look at these motifs to kind of, I hope, kind of shape my thinking of how I navigate the world. And so when I'm bumping into folks, it's just like, you know what? None of us are perfect. The work that we do is not perfect. Uh, we all make mistakes. And how do we continue to invite others to become better? How do we improvise when things don't quite go the way we want them to go? But how can we come together uh, to make things better? So I think this notion of looking at it as an imperfect art is a stark reminder that none of us, well, I have not met. Uh, would, to do respect, all due respect to those that I've met in this room, right? Not quite met people who are perfect, close to it, right? There's some exemplars in here that may be close to it, right? Uh, but uh, I think there is a sense in which uh, this is a reminder, especially for the work that we do as well. And I think sometimes academic medicine, um, the pressures that trainees are often under, medical professionals are often under uh, with regard to getting it right all the time can just be exhausting and crushing in some ways. And so for me, I think institutions and organizations that can embrace that can, hopefully we can create a little space uh, for us to, as my dear grandmother used to say, just to be. So I think of people who are perfect in their own mind. And that's <laughs> all I'm gonna say about that. But, but I, this, this, we talk about this issue of criteria. And um, it reminds me of, or, or makes me think about the ways in which we build criteria such that we even forget that we built those criteria. Mm -hmm. 
that they start to almost have a life of their own as being sort of written in stone of this is what matters. So if I think about um, the, the academic environment, these are the coin of realm, the realm that tell you that this is important work or that it should be advanced. Um, but who created those criteria and how are they created and, and, and the why? And so as, as I listened to you, um, it was this part of where are we questioning? And going back to um, as you were talking about this syncopation. And what I wrote down is what's missing, who's missing, who's not in the room, whose voice is not heard, as we come up with these types of things. And could you talk more about that? Because we have so much faith in this written criteria and these things that we develop. Um, and what do we miss yeah. when we don't question them? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And one that you know I want to try to suggest uh, with as much uh, humility as I can muster that you know I, I have some ideas here uh, while also recognizing that uh, I, like everyone else, has limitations and we can only see from where we sit, right? Uh, and so that's why it's important. I think feminist philosophers are right, right? Standpoint epistemology where we have more around the table uh, that can expand our field of vision uh, in that respect, which is maybe a partial answer to your question there, Dr. E, in some ways. Uh, but yeah, so this, this about voices missing, uh, missing I, I do think I have been encouraged in some ways by conversations that are happening uh, amongst uh, legal theorists working with respect to medicine and this movement of health justice. One of the things that they have emphasized is uh, thinking about respect for communities and really engaging communities to get a sense of what it is that uh, are the, the needs, right, that perhaps we should be uh, putting more resources towards in some ways. And again, uh, for the kind of the themes that we've been talking about this evening, uh, when we're able to engage in these very strategic and intentional, right, uh, partnerships with communities, again, I think this represents a kind of, you know, call and response, kind of opening up the space, uh, notions of syncopation, you know, often in terms of, you know, looking uh, for those kind of on the outside uh, in many respects and being able to, again, improv improvisationally create something new, this economy of play. And what's fascinating also, uh, you mentioned just, um, a lot of, of our medical ethics at times, uh, and I, I think this is a phrase I should probably remember, but I think Paul Farmer kind of raised this phrase of the thinking about some medical ethics as the quandaries of the affluent or something like that, right? And it's so interesting, right, just thinking about that. When, you, when I remember when I cut my teeth uh, in uh, kind of clinical ethics, uh, I, I noticed that, right? It was just, well, I, well, let me put this way. I didn't notice it at first. I just kind of jumped in. We're in these spaces and, you know, kind of wrestling with these issues, these ideas, um, these dilemmas that were emerging. And then I remember uh, taking a trip with a hospice care doc. Um, we were sent over to do some work in Nairobi, Kenya, and we're participating in a conference, meeting with some other community groups, uh, doing some work in Kibera, uh, you know, as well as some house visits. So it was this, you know, a couple of weeks we were over there doing this work. And I realized, I was like, oh, the way I was kind of framing and thinking about clinical ethics and thinking about this is like, these are like quandaries of the affluent, right? Quandaries of the fortunate, right? In some ways, because there was a whole host of questions that others were asking who weren't in the room that many of the methods, or maybe not methods, but many of the resources that I had been exposed to at that time in medical ethics just, just didn't touch upon uh, in some ways. And so I think this is where, uh, like Paul Farmer, right, when he talks about this preferential option for the poor, as he was in conversation with Gustavo Gutierrez, Father Gustavo Gutierrez, in terms of a, a Latin American liberation theologian, that emphasizes that, that this becomes the kind of the normal pattern and inviting folks in those rooms. And again, syncopation is not just simply listening to the uh, offbeat, but it's paying attention to the main beat and the offbeat, right? That we can do both of those things at the same time and continue to see who's not there. Um, yeah. So as you talk about that, there is, it feels to me almost inherent in this, and as you talk about this, improvisation, a letting go. And, 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 and a letting go that what I know is the only way. 
or what I understand is all there is to understand in, in that space. Um, and you talked about flexibility, creativity, reimagining the moment. Can you talk about that, how, particularly how that relates to medical ethics today? Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, it's interesting, uh, this notion of the, the limitations, right? Um, uh, and I've heard musicians sometimes talk about, you know, the improvisation, like taking a risk, right? And I remember wrestling with this, uh, Dr. Reed, um, thinking, okay, if, so I think about this in terms of the, like the ethical life, and then when I started turning my attention and say, what does this make this mean for, made this mean for like bioethics or something like that in particular, then I thought about this issue, right, that you raised, it's like, how do we think about like taking risk, right? You know, do I want a medical professional who is, you know, uh, trained kind of, you know, excuse me, like taking a risk if I'm the patient, right? But then I said, okay, well, maybe it's not that kind of thing. But this whole idea of letting go really does, in terms of, let's say, say a question about the medical ethics, that if it is true that Paul Farmer and others, you know, are talking about uh, some of our medical ethics is framed as this kind of quandary for the affluent or something along that line, uh, then what does it mean to kind of let go of some of the... the um, the clarity that we think we have with some of our ethical uh, concepts, right? How do we take risk in the sense of actually looking be uh, looking at the parameters that are maybe creating some of the problems that are inherent in some of our organizations? Uh, oftentimes, we'll engage in these ethical dilemmas with the given of the context that we find ourselves, right? And so we're in these kind of you know boxes, so to speak, and we're trying to figure out doing medical ethics within the box without actually stopping to say, um, why are we putting ourselves in these boxes? And this becomes especially challenging and tricky when we start thinking about the economics of healthcare, right? You know, and some of the questions that surround that and these big, you know, kind of movements and, and the, 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 the push, right, in certain ways. And I do think this notion of improvisation does help us to just always be um, ready to just kind of reimagine uh, the way that we're doing these things, to kind of reimagine uh, what it means to center other voices, even in our research, right? What does it mean to look at other traditions? That's one of the things I appreciate about, you know, Paul Farmer, whose footprint was large in a space like, you know, this is the fact that he was influenced by uh, Latin American liberation theologians, right, uh, in a particular, drew some of the resources from a particular tradition to reimagine what public health could look like and the way he actually engaged on the ground in various places throughout the world. And so for me, I think uh, that could be a representation of what some of this could look like in action, at least from my, my vantage point. So as you think about the education and training, of individuals who go down this space. How do you build that into the thinking? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. We, we're wrestling with this uh, where I am in the Trent Center. Uh, as most of the folks in here know, as you know, uh, as being uh, at the head of a, of a medical school that just trying to find space in the curriculum, right, uh, you know, insert uh, ethics or these different types of, I would say, you know, disposition, dispositional attitudes or framing, there's just not space. Like, where does it go? And so one of the things that we try to do is to, uh, rightly or wrongly, or um, if we think we're, we're showing some effects, is to try to generate an enclave uh, kind of on the side, a way that we're going to do some of this work. We're going to talk about some of these values. We're going to train uh, people to begin to think about these issues. You have to find the space to be able to pull away. So we have a number of you know, programs, uh, some fellowships we're involved in where we're trying to emphasize these things to kind of redirect people's attention uh, to other parts of the system where we may say, hey, we need to continue to kind of push at this with the idea that hopefully over time folks will continue to go out in that space and there will be this kind of critical mass uh, in some ways. And so uh, we try to emphasize these issues through our programming. So we've been very intentional, let's say, at a place like the Trent Center of our larger lectures, making sure that there's some component of that, working with um, various uh, schools across the university uh, and centers who are emphasizing you know, questions of justice, particularly health justice, and trying to find strategic ways to partner and make those spaces available for uh, many of the uh, medical students, nursing students, and others who are being trained for the health professions as well. 
And at the same time, uh, for those medical professionals who are already practicing the system, we've identified them, you know? So we're trying to say, uh, hey, we have a space for you. Um, I'll just, in this particular question with, with this quick little story, my, uh, we had a mentor, or I had a mentor, uh, he was out of Detroit, I was there for a number of years, and he would bring several of us together uh, every couple of years, right, in Detroit. Was about, I think at that time, it was about 18 of us. And so he would give us all these, you know, talks and speeches or whatever. And we'd sit around this room, and then he would say this phrase. He would just say, even if you're sitting at a table by yourself, never be alone. And the guy, you know, next to me was kind of nodding, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like this, yeah, yeah. And I leaned over, I said, <laughs> What the hell are talking about, right? You know? And then the guy was nodding. He was like, the hell if I know, right? You know? And it was, just, it was the kind of funniest moment, right? You know? And, and then I saw it. So we went and we asked, you know, this guy. And we are like, hey, what do you mean by that? And then what did he do? He just repeated things. Like, if you're ever sitting at a table by yourself, never be alone. We're like, that's not helpful, right? You know? And so it was like probably after the fourth, you know, time of, you know, us meeting together and gathering when he said that. Uh, and after we had some more life experience and professional experience, I finally kind of started picking up on what he meant by that, right? Is he was just basically, Sorry, yes. What did he mean? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right this is what, so, so basically this is what he was saying. He, he was basically saying that make sure you have your people uh, out there, that you recognize that there are so many others that are out there who are thinking the way that you do, who share certain types of values that you all are connected together so that even if you're not physically in the same place, you can sit at a table and know at the end of the day that I'm not by myself. So no matter what I may say or try to introduce in this space, you, I'm not going to allow you to look at me like I'm crazy or think that I don't know what I'm talking about because though I'm sitting here by myself, I ain't alone, right? And I know that. And so I do think that that's one of the things that we're trying to encourage others to think about as well, to say, even if you're in those spaces where it has not kind of been part of this larger culture of health with these kinds of things, just remember that you're not alone. You're not by yourself, right? Continue to do the work, right? Um, and then making sure we find those moments to come together. That's what I love about jazz, that even though, uh, especially when you look at the context, out, the social, political, historical context when it was birthed, it, there was great suffering that was going on like outside those spaces. And when people came together, it was this kind of cathartic release, right? A moment of joy, and especially when some of these musicians talk about when they swing or they found the groove, right, where everything is in sync, right? It may only last for the time of that performance, but it lasted for the time of that performance, right? It was just enough to say, exhale and continue doing the work. And so that's part of what a few of us are trying to encourage. Right, many folks to, to think about uh, and to recognize that um, even though there may be a few of you, you're not by yourself, and that grows, right? It grows. Just like jazz spread from this little space all over the world because people bumping into each other, uh, so too can, I think, the values that are embraced um, by this music, uh, that's more than a music, can also be contagious. So as you, you talk about this social, political, historical context, you know that I work in the DEI space. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and we're at a very interesting time mm -hmm. um, in our country. But I think we have always been in a very interesting time in our country as we think about this, again, sociopolitical historical context. And can, can you take us from what you talked about in those sessions about not being alone? And what are some of the lessons or thoughts for those who are in this space today trying to move forward around those values of equity and justice and feeling so all alone yeah. in that space? Uh, um, I was at an event last night uh, at our campus in North Carolina. and. We were talking with we had a number of medical students in the room. It was an ethics night. And one of the surgeons who was uh, sharing some reflections on this panel, he was just talking about a program that he's kind of set up with a few others to try to combat the loneliness that many of these medical trainees are experiencing. And you know, they were saying that it is a serious problem uh, in some ways. And 
all I can do is, I think, just make some of the connections, right? When I think about these smaller individualized communities um, uh, coming together uh, in these spaces, kind of showing up and being counted, being present. And so for me, I, this is, well, let me, let me back up and, and think about it this way in terms of the, the loneliness question. So there are certain spaces where I was going up that, um, you know, you could just kind of go and you jump in. The way I thought about it was almost like... Um, I'm not sure if everybody will kind of catch the right. Well, maybe this reference may work. So you think about that old uh, television show Cheers, right? You know, walk in, be like, oh, no, or whatever, right? So all these conversations are going on. You kind of come in, you maybe join one. Other conversations are happening at the same time. You jump to another conversation. Uh, conversation was happening before you got there. Uh, while you were there, once you leave, things are still kind of happening, right? So it's kind of in and out. Um, some would say that that kind of space represents a sense of belonging, right? Uh, for me, growing up, there was uh, s several different little institutions or spaces, right? There was the uh, the local barber shop that was right up the road, right? When I had hair, and yes, I had hair. At that time, so don't look at me funny and try to judge me either. Right? You know, uh, so I would go to the barber shop. You know, you kind of come in, uh, and there was just people there. You just kind of they embrace you. You just kind of belonged. Uh, you didn't understand everything that was being talked about at the time, but you know, there was there were these spaces and these places. And just slowly but surely, you know, you would see people and you bump into yours, but there was just this sense of, hey, well, there's a community, there are these spaces. For me, it was also like a faith community, right, where the elders were just like those who were older than us. They kept imparting wisdom, telling us to believe the best about ourselves and not to internalize the messaging that we, that we may see of negative stereotypes for ourselves and all these different kinds of things. And so one of the things I've tried to do is to say, okay, well, look, if these are things that were helpful for me, you know, uh, how can I try to create the conditions or contribute to the conditions that can be that space for others. And so again, uh, this is where the observation or the questions, questions of syncopation, just looking at those areas, those spaces that we can generate something uh, that can, uh, if we can find it, that's part of what's already going because everybody's really busy to pull them away. But I've come to uh, believe that people um, find the time for those things that are most important to them and those things perhaps that they most need. Uh, so that's not a very clear and concise and probably a good answer uh, to your question, but as I've often tell my students, that's all I got. <laughs> it, it, it's a good answer, but your other part of you're not alone. Yes. Well, thank you. That's such, right. That's such, right. An, such an important part. Yep. Yep. But I also wonder how the call and response might work or relate to part of this and you talked about this requiring deep listening. And as I look at organizations and their capacity to create environments for change, mm -hmm. um, to address what we see around us, and you talked about all the disparities and these other kinds of things and this deep listening, some su suggestions about how to approach that be it to the community, be it to our patients, be it to our students. Um, and is there a part of this? Where does dissonance mm -hmm. fit into this? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, the social dissonance, right? Uh, again, I'm not a musical theorist, but uh, the question of dissonance becomes a really, it's a really important, I think, concept, right? Uh, in jazz where there's this uh, kind of discord in the music, a kind of discomfort, not easy to listen to, right? Uh, and in some ways, it may seem as if well, somebody just did something wrong, right? Because there's all this dissonance that emerges. And one of the things that the, the impact right, of that distance in the music is a kind of indication to actually create uh, for us to emote in ways that uh, we are uneasy, that we are uncomfortable being in that moment, right? And the tendency that we want to jump to is to relieve the tension, right? Or to uh, ease the dissonance, right? But it's interesting because at times, musicians with respect to particular performances, they don't want to let us off the hook, right? They continue to create a kind of dissonance for us so that we can sit with that and begin to think and to reflect. And one of the things is, it's interesting in terms of this deep listening, so listening to what's going on where we have this pool that we want the resolution, right? But I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of the work 
that dissonance actually can do for us. Okay, and it's interesting um, when I think about um, um, John Coltrane. Right, there was this uh, recording I think he did live at. The Birdland or something, and it's all this kind of, it almost seems like bebop, and so those who are uh, jazz aficionados, if you're saying Birdland, like he wasn't really doing uh, bebop on those first three tracks, okay, forgive me, right? Uh, but you go back and listen to it, and then you get to that, uh, I think, fourth or fifth track, uh, Alabama, right? Where uh, many, the drummer, right, uh, with him at the time was saying he was writing that as a response to the uh, 16th Street uh, Baptist Church bombing in um, uh, Montgomery, Alabama, when those four little uh, black girls were killed uh, during the civil rights movement. And it's fascinating because you'll listen, so the, all these other tracks are, you know, kind of this seemingly like bebop, whatever, kind of going along. You get to this track, and it's completely different, right, from everything else on there. And then all of a sudden, at the very end, there is this, like, long, drawn-out screech, like a squeal on the horn, right? And it's just... And it stops, right? And you're like, I mean, give me something, right? I mean, some resolution. But Coltrane was just basically at the point where looking at the social, cultural, historical context, all that was going on, it was this screen to say, is there really a resolution here, right? And it was this notion of dissonance. It was doing some work because it was so stark that it makes people stop and reflect. And so this notion of deep listening, right? Listening to what... Coltrane is calling people to do in terms of how to respond is not just easily pass through the dissonance or to easily go through the tension, but to recognize the sordid legacy and history that brought us to this point and to stop and listen. Some religious traditions talk about the role of laments, right? They'll say, just stop and grieve. Don't try to fix it. Stop and grieve and recognize things aren't the way they're supposed to be. So I think for me, when we wrestle with these issues, patients, students, professionals, entering, uh, inviting them into the space, sometimes it's going to be hard conversations that we have to have. Sometimes it's going to be hard to hear, right? Sometimes we want to be quick to move beyond it, move past it, and work to an early resolution, right? But part of call and response and the improvisation piece is recognizing what is necessary and important and appropriate at that moment. And it may not always be what we think it is. Which makes me wonder if when things feel really comfortable, that we shouldn't be listening for the dis dissonance. Dr. Reed, I'd love to hear you riff on that. Because, <laughs> hey, you know, like I said, I, I come from a particular uh, tradition where we would say to that, amen, right? You know, so that's what I would say, right, uh, to that. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. When you, when I, when I listen to this, and it, it is so intriguing, and I have learned so much. You have, you have um, made me think, which is so important, so very important. When I, I think about this space, and I think about public health and, and art and how it comes together, what can we learn from the arts as we apply to public health and the issues of yeah, I, th I think the arts have a way of really um, uh, helping kind of reshape our imagination of what possibilities could be. Um, uh, you know, I've been thinking about what many artists were, are, you know, have done coming through the pandemic uh, in ways that they can help us emote to situations, right? Uh, look, I train as a moral philosopher, so I, you know, have a tendency to lean towards the more kind of abstract conceptual reasoning just because of condition you know, that way in some respects. And at the same time, right, uh, how we emote to states of affairs, to situations, to experiences is extremely important. And I actually would argue that it has kind of cognitive content uh, to us, uh, uh, to those, um, uh, when, we, when we think about emoting to uh, situations, I'm sorry, I lost track of your, uh, what was the? Uh, art and public. No, art, public health, sorry, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, so what do the arts kind of contribute to this? So again, helping us, uh, to uh, reimagine these these new possibilities, and so what's fascinating is or it help us to emote uh, in ways that perhaps conceptual reasoning doesn't allow us to uh, emote. And there's a kind of familiarity that people sometimes intuitively 
experience uh, that connects with lived experience, embodied experiences. Now, having said that, I do think that the public health sector needs to incorporate the arts much more in its work and not in a way that is merely just the public health sector. Here's our message. Give it to the artist and say, you just translate this so that, you know, the community now will be engaged to basically do what we say. Right. But no, actually, in a way that I think the arts actually are um, um, knowledge producers, right, such that the work of artists, art and their artifacts can actually inform what the message of public health should be, such that there should be strategic partnerships all the way around. And if there are strategic partnerships and if the public health sector sees that there is value in the arts or there's added value, well, well then that is worthy of financial resources being invested in those relationships, right? Uh, and this becomes extremely important. One thing I do want to say, because I have talked about uh, in this you know, in the, the, the talk today about your know, jazz, the concepts and these motifs and all this and the arts here, the benefits. You know, one of the things that I uh, emphasize or try to emphasize with others is that um, whenever we talk about these issues, that it has to be marked and characterized by realism and not romanticism. Because I think sometimes we can romanticize the arts, right? Looking at the, the positives uh, and the, you know, benefits. But we have to recognize it at the same time that the arts have been used for some very nefarious ends uh, and they can be manipulated and manipulate people in different ways, right? And so I think we always have to be careful with that. Uh, matter of fact, uh, here, I just want to give her a shout out. Uh, I don't think she's in the room here, but uh, a jazz musician in the area here, uh, Tia Fuller. Uh, who's a, she teaches at Berkeley School of Music, uh, a saxophonist, performing artist. And one of the things that uh, she did when she was nominated for a Grammy, she used that opportunity in 2019 to address uh, sexism in jazz, right? Where uh, the way women have been marginalized in that space and even the larger telling of those stories, right, becomes a serious issue and a problem. And so even though we look at these internal resources to try to help us with the ethical life, we also recognize that it can't be romanticized because the same resources that could be beneficial uh, for us are the same resource that can also stifle forms of flourish. For some of the history of the, the research that we've done that we thought moved us forward held us back. Yes, that's right, that's right. And the residuals of that research stay with us today in ways um, that hinder our capacity to deliver equitable care, to have quality health systems and all of those other kinds of things. So for me, listening to you, it's this understanding of where can you bring in the good, but with it also understand there's another side. That's right, um, always. And, and, and this, this listening, this syncopation, this improvisation, this call and response, um, I thank you for challenging us. I thank you for opening us to another way of thinking and, and listening and learning. Thank you for all that you've given us today. Thank you.